everybody. Uh, welcome to the British Computer Society SIGIST event. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about how quality has changed over time, how views of quality have changed over time. Uh, I've got with me Mary and Tom Poppendike, uh, who have written five books, I think. Four. Uh, four books on the topic of, of lean, um, which is quite important from a, a quality perspective, and we'll, we'll talk about why uh, during this event. Um, so a couple of housekeeping things, first of all. First of all, this is open to uh, both BCS members and, and non-members. Um, if you are a BCS member, two weeks ago, we put live a BCS community forum, uh, like a web-based discussion forum. And I think already 400 people have signed up for that. I'd strongly recommend joining, if you're a member, to, to engage with the, the rest of the community. Seeing some really good discussions going on on there, some really good collaboration already. Um, in terms of um, how this event will run, uh, we're going to have a chat. Please put questions on the, the, the Zoom chat if you have them, and we'll work those into the discussion, and then we'll try and clear all those out uh, before the end. We'll run for up to an hour, depends how many questions you all have, I think. Um, and yeah, I think that's it, apart from one more thing, because I know that some people uh, do leave just before the end. Our next event is on the 22nd of February, and that's all about diversity and how diversity um, can help with testing. Um, and that will be with Callum Akers Ryan. So please try and join that as well. Okay, so Mary and Tom, let's let's get started. Um, I, I think probably we, the best place to start is if you just want to introduce yourselves a little bit in your own words. We've got your bios on the event, and they're probably too long for, long for me to um, read. Could you just introduce yourselves, first of all? Sure. My name is Mary Poppendick. I started out uh, my career in programming at Bell Telephone Laboratories in 1967, programming the number two ASS computer, uh, which is a telephone switching computer. And I've done uh, lots of other programming jobs for the next, say, 20 years, but almost always in the engineering area. I did Process control programming at 3M was sort of where I ended up. And then some product development stuff. And I worked in a manufacturing plant when we happened to do one of the real early lean implementations or just in time implementations at 3M. And then in uh, 1999, I retired from 3M. And after a little while, I discovered how software was being developed by other people at the time. And I thought, you know, I ought to write a book and see how, and, and mention how what we thought of as just in time came to be called lean in software or in manufacturing. If you just took the principles, not the practices, but the principles, how would you apply it to software development? So the rest is four more books and an awful lot of world traveling later. Here we are. I started out as a physicist, um, drifted into teaching electronics and computer classes at the university, went back to um, industry, um, developed uh, systems for supporting um, inertial navigation system development at Honeywell, um, became part of a company, a group that did um, ERP development, and ended up my career as a consultant teaching object-oriented programming to people that wanted to get to state of the art back in the 90s. Um, when the crash happened in 2001, which is probably when many of you were just thinking about getting into the field, um, decided to retire and pursue a retirement hobby with Mary, which is what we're talking about today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's start with quality. So, you know, quality is a very abstract term that lots of people have tried to define and, and measure for many decades. Right. And I think one, one, one thing that is prevalent in the testing profession, uh, because our audience is, is mostly testers, is that um, people typically think about quality in terms of their job, and they think about conforming with requirements because they're often given a set of requirements or some basis of tests to go and prove something against. Uh, and a lot of people you know, are fighting quite rightly for Quality, quality to be perceived in a, a wider sense, the value to the customer. Um, but then you get into all sorts of other problems. I mean, 
lots of people would say iPhones are high quality. I don't think they're high quality because they don't do the things that I, they don't let me do the things I want to do. They wall functionality away from me and I like to fiddle with things and, and change the settings in ways you can't on an iPhone. So there's different groups of customers and how they perceive different things that are very, very subjective. So, so what, what's, your, what's your position or preferred definition of, of quality? I like simply doing what it's supposed to do. And what it's supposed to do is not really any kind of requirements document or anything like that. It is really fitness for purpose. Um, a game, for example, if it crashes occasionally, might still be a high quality game because it's lots of fun. A financial application that gives you wrong answers is a catastrophe. So it's the purpose that matters um, in determining whether something is of good quality or not. Um, and that encompasses all kinds of things like how fast is it? Does it perform well enough? Um, how reliable is it? Um, does it give the right answers? Does it give the right experience? It depends on the purpose. Mm. And where the purpose comes from is really the key, I think, um, to not only what traditional views of quality are in terms of requirements documents that you referred to, but the evolving ones in terms of digitization of the end-to-end -end experience that people have as they interact with software-enabled um, things. When I wrote my first book, I used the word integrity instead of quality um, because internal integrity and external integrity were the way that the current writers that wrote about the way Toyota thought about the world um, were talking about quality. Mm. And so that kind of integrity meant it was coherent. It was, it was uh, easy to use. It held together as a single thing. It was intuitive, those, those sorts of things like that. I think that fits really well with Tom's fitness for purpose. Mm. And do you think um, the definition of quality has changed significantly? Because if I look back at the 60s and 70s, I still see all these varying definitions of, of quality. Do you think that's something that's changed over time? Well, it depends on what world you're coming from, because remember most of my software time was spent in an engineering department. And when I was in an engineering department, we had a problem for most of our problems were put a control system on a new manufacturing line plant or line that's going into a 3M plant. And quality there was that it worked, it made good product, it could be maintained by the plant engineer, the operators found it easy to use. Hmm. And we defined what that all meant because we were the engineers, that was our job. And then we made sure that it could do those five or six key things using the latest technology and when we went to the plant to install it, we did it rather quickly. We'd done a whole bunch of integrity checks before we shipped it. And we tended to bring it up basically on time with very few punchless items, the things that needed to be changed. And that's how we thought of quality. But when I worked in a manufacturing plant, um, quality was in fact a set of product specs because when we were going to ship something, we had, we were making magnetic tape and the quality of the magnetic tape and the cassette that it was in was partly defined by some specs, but it was also defined doesn't degrade over time. And uh, I remember when we very first, when it was very first in the manufacturing plant, some of the really early mag tapes that 3M made that were in broadcasting companies had an uh, uh, adhesive problem, just gluing the adhesive onto the reel, which started to bleed and ruin the tape. And we actually had to replace all kinds of, of reels of tape because over time they degraded and didn't do the job that they needed to do, which was keep that movie preserved for years, for decades. So uh, you didn't, ever when we were doing product development, want to have so much perfection in your product that it was too expensive to make. You had to meet the needs of the customer that you were aiming for within the price range that you were aiming for rather than have something that was perfect. 
I read in one of your books um, something, I think it was called Concurrent Development, and it was an example of people in manufacturing where uh, in, in the US, I believe, they were taking a very sort of waterfall approach to, manu- I think it was car doors? Yeah. Yeah, I think a very waterfall approach, getting everything right before passing it on to the next stage versus Japan, where they were introducing, they were sort of only cutting bits at a time. I thought that was a fascinating uh, example about how, you know, know, we sometimes think that manufacturing is this big waterfall thing because people have to make parts and pass them down this this, conveyor belt and software is completely different. But I don't think that's always true, is it? Can you maybe maybe tell a bit about that example for the audience? Well, um, I want to just say something about manufacturing being one thing that never changes. (laughs) <laughs> Anybody that thinks that hasn't actually worked in the manufacturing plant, because that's just not the way it is. The product specs would change, you know, frequently. The product, the process would change frequently. We would constantly improve it and that sort of thing. But what happened in that uh, era was that most people thought about most software development as having a requirements document uh, that hopefully was testable, although generally not and then writing some code and then making, writing tests from the requirements document and then comparing how the tests work and how the code worked and finding any mismatches and getting rid of them. And that basically was quality. Um, But what happened in uh, manufacturing, especially in Toyota, was that their idea was you constantly aim towards the final results. And as you go there, you get better and better. But when you have that car done, um, you haven't predetermined everything about the car when you start building it. You've predetermined enough to get to the next step. And then you refine your knowledge of how a car door, you know, of the exact dimensions of the car door as you start up the manufacturing process, because maybe the manufacturing process can't quite line things up perfect. And maybe you have to rethink exactly the detailed dimensions. Wow, in, you know, in the US, it all had to be predetermined before it went to the manufacturing line. At Toyota, the mechanism to move something into manufacturing was much more incremental and allowed both the process and the product to be changed as they were merged, which was really a novel concept in, in even the manufacturing that I worked in. It's fundamentally an approach to learning what's needed rather than trying to speculate as to what might be needed. Speculation is much less reliable than learning based on actually trying it. Yep. I think that's right. And I think one of the advantages we've got in software, and there's a lot of this focus on kind of shifting things right. So lots of people have talked for a long time about shifting things left and preventing defects. Um, But there's an increasing trend towards getting stuff out in front of users, especially if you have a large volume of users, A-B testing, feature flags, being able to deploy and roll back changes very quickly. So you can really kind of get that customer input on things in real time, which I think is is very uh, counterintuitive to how a lot of people think, or have certainly thought in the past in in quality. Certainly counterintuitive to the way it was 20 years ago, hopefully Mm. not so counterintuitive anymore. So the early software was basically done in the early IT software anyway, not engineering software, was basically done in companies to automate those companies' processes like banks. Okay, we got to automate. The, when I was a kid, I took a paper book to the bank and they wrote in the change when I put money in the bank. All those processes need to be automated. So you had IT departments and you could predefine how that, you know, how that accounting system ought to work. And it didn't change. Um, But as we started moving out away from automating business processes, first of all, our customers change. We no longer have the business processes and the people running them as our customers. But now we are moving software into products. Mm. And as we're moving software into products, we actually are in control of the most changeable part of that product. The hardware is much more difficult to change than the software. And we always known in most any kind of product development, I was involved in soft goods product development, like tape and stuff like that. You don't really know what customers want until you give it to them. And so as since we sit in the spot where we can do the most adaptation to the customers 
after we start delivering, the idea that everything should be perfect is from a different era. It's from when we were trying to perfectly run an accounting system, not when we were trying to adapt to what you know people on the web might want when the, their needs are gonna change every six months. And if we can't be adapting, then we're not living in the current era where our customers are constantly adapting. If we can't adapt to our customers, they're going to leave us behind because they're definitely used to stuff being flexible and changing as they change. Uh, yeah, I think we talked about quality being about the purpose, but the purpose can change. You know, the, the reason why the customers want to use your product can change quickly. When you have products that you're writing software for rather than having business processes you're automating, you can almost be sure you don't know what that product ought to be. And even if you know what it ought to be today, once it gets delivered, if that delivery is, you know, a year from now, it's not going to be the same. Back in the last century, when the focus was on automating, the um, metric was productivity and cost savings. And if it saved you money and it didn't cost too much to implement, that was good. That was quality. Um, but there are two dimensions to quality. One is, does it do what it's supposed to? Mm -hmm. And the second is what it's supposed to do worth anything. In other words, you can build the thing wrong or you can build the wrong thing. And I saw someplace a few weeks ago that somebody speculated that 90% of investment in software is building the wrong thing. That sounds that likely. It doesn't get used. That mm. doesn't provide the experience that people expect. Um, that is probably the most serious defect in all the work we do. So let's talk about lean because I don't think many, uh, I don't think as many quality and testing practitioners think about lean as often as they should and as often as, as you would like probably. Um, so what are the kind of key messages of lean that you think are important from a, a quality and testing perspective? So the um, Shigeo Shingo is the guy that wrote sort of the book who also did most of the experiments at early experiments at Toyota. And he had a saying saying that um, you don't test quality into a product. What you're doing with quality is making sure the product can't make a mistake. So what you do is um, I like to think about it as uh, you don't go around this is Minnesota, right? And we have lots of mosquitoes. They're like our state bird or something like that. And there's lots of mosquitoes around here. Now, that means that every house has screens on the windows. Mm -hmm. I notice when I visit Europe, very often the houses don't have screens, but to, the, to us, that's like, wow. So the question is, is quality going around and swatting all the mosquitoes that get into your house? Or is quality putting up the screens to keep them out? And the concept is quality is making mistakes impossible or difficult or hard to happen and making it very difficult to make mistakes. It's not finding the mistakes after they happen. So Toyota had a way of making cars in which they just didn't have defects. People thought it was impossible, but that's because everybody thinking about quality there was thinking about how do I make it impossible for defects to get into the system not how do I find them once I get in and get out. It's the major difference between the way you think when you're lean and the way you think when you're not. So quality is not about removing bugs. The idea of rewarding people for finding defects is just wrong. The idea is what you try to do is working together from whoever's writing code, who's ever going to be responsible for making sure that it works, working together to make sure that the, the mechanism for deploying the code is mistake proofed. We had the, the concept of mistake proofing was very, very solid in manufacturing, even in US manufacturing, but mistake proofing our code, we never did. And the reason we didn't do mistake proofing of our code was we, we didn't use our own tools. We didn't use software to test our code. In fact, some of the first automated testing with some of the unit testing stuff that Kent Beck did in 1999, he wrote the first J, J unit. And then we started to be able to do unit testing automatically. And we started to be able to do uh, uh, system or customer testing automatically. And it took another decade before we were in 2010, before we were able to 
actually test our code after we wrote it and put it in a pipeline and let the test take care of making sure that it's good when it goes into production. And prior to being able to test our code automatically, use our own tools to solve our problem, we did not, we never thought about testing as mistake proofing the code. But if you just take that concept, you're trying to make mistakes impossible and think about, um, and the other thing is you wanna make them visible right away. Okay, so if I'm a developer and I'm writing code and I've been a developer and I've written code, I do not wanna find out six months from now that what I did was wrong. I don't wanna find out two days from now that what I did was wrong. I wanna do something and then I wanna know that it's right. And until we actually did automated testing, that was not possible because the manual tests, they had to be written, they had to be run by people and they had to be run many times. If you would use them many times and there just weren't that many people to run that many tests. So everything was bunched into a great big batch called a release and people worked on, say it was a six month release, they'd work on it for four months, freeze the code for two months, tester would test, find out whatever problems there were. And of course there were problems. And then I wouldn't find out that something I did was wrong until like months later, way too late. So what we've moved from is saying, wait a minute, our job is not to find defects, our job is to prevent defects. So what we need to do is have a way so that those developers, as soon as they write code, they can make sure that it's right. And that means that the things that we call tests are moved into the spot of being the specifications. So unit testing with automated testing means that you write the test as a specification and that specification is automated. And then you use your automated specifications to incrementally test your code as you go along, taking a spec when you think you've actually got it working, you turn it on so that it tests and then you make sure your code constantly passes that test over time. That concept didn't exist 20 years ago. Well, let's say in 2000. The idea that you could automatically make sure that as soon as I did something, I could find out if it was right and it could prevent the defects from going into the code base, that just didn't exist. Mm. And I think the biggest change is that testing is about preventing defects. It's not about finding them. It's about not letting them there in the first place. And to me, that's the fundamental thing that Lean brought to manufacturing and to the thinking about how you make uh, physical goods, and it's the fundamental thing it needs to bring to software. I think you're right. The tools have improved dramatically, and and ninety percent of the time, when I uh, go into an organisation or talk to a team, they're using that behaviour-driven approach. But often they're using it in an automated testing, uh, exclusively in an automated testing way. There isn't that whole business users involved in reviewing those specifications in the in that style of, sort of BDD and Gherkin, you know, it, I see it used a lot more as a test tool than really an end-to-end cross-discipline tool, which I think is a shame because I think it's extremely powerful when you align around an automated specification like that. There's another dimension to um, Lean that I think is critically important and is starting to make its way into the software world. And that is a focus on the customer. The, um, Every person in a lean organization understands that the purpose of their work, the purpose of their organization is to delight their customers, to make a difference, a positive difference for the people that are benefiting from the work that they do. In the software world, that is particularly critical that people understand that how what they are doing benefits the people mm. who are going to be impacted by the work they're doing. And um, every person um, in a lean organization understands how their work fits in to this larger picture. It's not about profit. It's about making a difference in the world. So we have a question from the, the audience, which I, I probably go to straight away. Um, there's a large gap between complexity of software at the point of development and test versus runtime. How do you see the quality of software at production in the context of lots of different microservices combined to provide purpose and experience? The system isn't the, the sum of its parts. Well, one of the th reasons why it took 
10, 15 years to really perfect the concept of automated testing. Um, let me just interject one thing before I finish this. If you think about it, your test framework is your specification. And that was always true. The way you test your product actually in, ends up being the way that you specify it. So let's go back to when you try to test everything all of the time automatically, you rapidly run into a massive problem because that's way too many tests. So um, the concept of architecture comes in. And you can't take a great big monolithic team and put together anywhere is near enough tests to test the whole thing because they would take forever. There's way too many of them. So in addition to in, um, incremental development and in addition to mistake proofing the code, there had to be a way of thinking about stuff in such a way that you could in fact pretty much make sure that stuff is going to work. Mm. And the way that that evolved is that the concept of loosely coupled code became paramount. I mean, we've always known about dependencies, but when we first started talking to people in the early 2000s, it was, how do we deal with dependencies? And I'm sitting here thinking, why do you have dependencies? Because if you have a tightly coupled dependencies, automated testing isn't going to work. So what you're trying to do is create a mechanism whereby you can have a chunk of code, let's call it a service just for the heck of it. And you have control over your inputs and you have control over your outputs and you can test both your inputs, your outputs and your internal logic. And then you have a sequence of those and the, the, at the next level, you also have some services put together and you have a sequence of those, but every internal concept chunk can be independently tested and then you can test the mechanisms whereby you put them together. And at a certain point, you can build up enough confidence that, for example, if you're Amazon and you're making a change in how you're uh, checking on the credit of somebody works, that that's not going to change their order. It, it might have an error in the way that it looks at credit, but that's totally disjoint from uh, actually making the charge on your credit card. So what you're trying to do is have loosely coupled code with known boundaries and testing at the boundaries rather than trying to test everything, mm -hmm. which means that if you have a tightly coupled architecture, uh, I think all bets are off. I really do. Um, and the interesting thing is that in the 90s, and I remember this from when I was working at 3M in the 90s, Everything was about creating a master database in the company that sort of was integrated with everything. And guess what? That master database became a massive dependency generator because every single piece of code depended upon whatever was in the database. It meant if you made a change here, you had to check everything that might be impacted, which meant all those other things accessing the same point in the database had to be tested. That's why we had these massive big chunks of code tested. When I heard that Amazon in their cloud had gone away from a central corporate database, I thought they were crazy. I didn't think this was possible to run a big transaction system without having the database manage the transactions. But they broke it apart into services because they had such big concept of what they wanted to do that the constant dependency that everything generated couldn't be managed in a single computer. And instead, they broke stuff up into small pieces, which could be independently tested and test the input and test the output. And they had independent data structures, which they verified their integrity and so on. So at a certain point, and it was in the 2013-14 timeframe, they were doing, I don't know, uh, maybe a, bill, uh, a production change every 11 seconds. And they weren't always perfect. Um, there were ways to roll back problems, but they, uh, there were ways to test it on a very small batch of people, but they were much more solid, much less likely to cause problems because they were so small than the kind of testing which takes a great big clump of stuff and sort of big bang tosses it into a system. That big bang approach is way more fragile and way more fraught with probable errors and uh, risk 
than a very small incremental approach with a very good automated rollback system, which can test and make sure that it's actually working. So we got to quit thinking that every single piece of uh, uh, the customer expectations has been completely and thoroughly checked before we get to go live. And uh, we have to start thinking about how do we make sure that we can make very small changes and protect ourselves as we put those things live. The technical architecture that Mary's talking about is absolutely essential and vital mm. to the changes that have happened in the last couple of decades. But there's another set of architectural changes which are non-technical. And those are the organizational architecture, how people are organized. All of this is about how to get smart people to work together on problems that are too complex for any one person to grasp. And there are ways of organizing people that were very common in the 90s that um, were very ineffective at this, separating different concerns, different expertise um, that really didn't work very well at producing good results. Um, we're moving more towards a much more integrated approach whereby people focus not on their technical aspects of their work, but rather on um, the problem that they're together trying to solve. Um, one example is SpaceX. They have hierarchy of engineers, people that are responsible for different aspects of the uh, rockets of the satellites and they don't divide themselves as you have mechanical engineers and propulsion engineers and hydraulic engineers and software engineers and communication engineers you have people that are responsible for functions and they have all the different skills that they need on the team to come up with excellent solutions um, people that are good at finding problems, we used to be called testers, are among those people. Those are critical skills, absolutely. But they no longer function as a separate um, organizational entity. Not an audit function, right? <laughs> They're not an audit function. They are instead contributors toward achieving the overall goal that the whole group is focused on. So organizational architecture is every bit as important at enabling the um, modern approach to creating um, software-based things as all of the tools and uh, technical architecture components are. Mm. I want to add one more thing, okay? If you take a look at the last 20 years, one other big thing has happened, and that is that we've gone from running on hardware to running on infrastructure as code. And even our networks are code these days, like everything about some of the stuff that we do is code. Where do you stop testing? Okay, where, where's the end of the mm. code? It doesn't end. <laughs> and what do you test? Where do you know the defect is? I remember when we had a manufacturing plant and something would go wrong, the plant manager would also say, have we checked the testing equipment as well as the manufacturing process for the source of the error? because maybe the error was in the testing equipment. So have we checked our infrastructure as well as our, our running code inside the infrastructure for a source of problems? Have we got the whole thing working right? Um, and whose job is that? Mm. So it, we have to have a more integrated approach to how do we think about this tool we have because it's become so expansive, you know, and it used to be just functions, but now we're looking at data and we're looking at AI systems and uh, how do we know they're right? Boy, that's not the same kind of process, like it's different, but it's all about making sure that we do something that respects the customer and their need and make sure that it's solved. And you can't always do that and have it all figured out ahead of time. Mm. You look at SpaceX, they developed a uh, returnable booster rocket in about, oh, I don't know, five years, uh, something like an order of magnitude faster than booster rockets ever used to be done. They put stuff up in the air now with their booster rockets about a factor of seven cheaper than before. And how did they do that? Well, you can look online and you can see 
for some years there, a whole bunch of boost rockets going up and exploding. Okay, you've probably all seen that video. Why is that good? Because they didn't try to have that booster rocket perfect before they shot it off. They had it as ready as they could by the deadline of the shoot. Everybody put in their best shot at their piece of it. And when it went up, if it exploded, whoever turns out to be responsible for the explosion, and you'd better be able to figure out who, you know, why it exploded, they'd better have a story for Elon Musk within 24 hours of how that particular problem was never going to happen again. And it's by just trying things and instead of trying to figure out all the complex interactions of things, but letting the physical thing show you where the interactions are that aren't going to work right. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, the concept of testing for rocket science, by the way, has totally changed. Instead of having a completely perfect spec that's completely tested, you have a goal. We want to have a returnable rocket and you have a deadline when the next integration test is going to occur and you see how it goes and you fix the problems. So you expose and fix rather than figure it all out mentally before you can do it on, uh, physically. That's so another aspect that um, impacts testing. Um, those rocket shoots are heavily instrumented so that exactly what is happening is highly visible to the people that are responsible for making it happen. Every detail, every possible problem that they can think about might happen is instrumented. And when things go wrong, we suffer. they have a lot of data to mm. help them figure out what was the problem and how to fix it. And the same thing is happening in IT today in that um, our critical systems that are operating in the cloud need to be highly instrumented. They need to be very sensitive to anything that could go wrong so that uh, the people who are um, watching what's happening and adapting it and making sure it stays good can learn immediately, or maybe the system can fix itself whenever anomalies happen. Yeah, we call it observability mm. and it's key. And I think it's also, uh, it's a, the, the architecture that we talked about, the, the, the loosely coupled architecture um, that makes some of these things possible. Yes. It introduces, in my experience, a lot more non-functional problems. So you have to have that kind of observability over your infrastructure um, because you get a lot more problems that are difficult to find through classical functional automated or, or manual testing. Yep. Right. Speaking of data, so I've recently been working with a team and trying to get them to push things out the door faster. We've gone, we've shortened the releases a lot. We're still at a week. The automated testing still got, you know, a, a way to go. Um, but I, when I started doing this, I thought about the process itself, and I thought I need to measure the process because I, I like to measure things. Okay. Um, so I started looking at the amount of time things stay in different states. I call it time of right. state. How long are things spending in, in different states, whether it's sat on a backlog, whether it's uh, being worked on, whether someone's writing an automated test for it, et cetera. And uh, I, I found some interesting stuff from looking at that. I found that when things fail or go wrong or people get blocked, that's when they get stuck and they spend ages in that state before they, they move on. Those are the worst possible scenarios. So that was interesting. So we did some stuff around that. And we started to speed up and speed up and speed up. But my metrics all went the wrong way because I can only measure how long things spend in states really when they're done. And yeah. the faster we got, the more we were clearing older and older things from, from our backlog. So all my <laughs> metrics went the opposite way to how I expected them. And it looks like we're now uh, everything we're closing is really old. So interesting. Like, it looks really so. How do you how do you measure leanness? Or don't you? Um well, the, the concept of stuff getting stuck is the opposite of what I call flow. Mm. And the concept of flow means that you have a sequence of processes and when you finish your process, you do it because the next process is ready for it to be there. So it's a pull concept. So um, you, you always have capacity downstream. You don't push stuff into a pile you push stuff because the downstream process is asking for more. Mm. 
And if you make sure that your downstream processes always have capacity, that's a really solid lean concept is that you should have a process that is always ready for when something gets, gets headed in its direction. So if you have processes that are ready for the next thing to come that tell you when to start the, the upstream process because it's ready for you to, you know, you need it once it's you're the next one on this agenda, then things flow fast because they don't have a spot to get stuck. When we switched our manufacturing process from a push using my scheduling computer to push stuff to a pull concept where we used cards, Kanban cards to schedule every single station in the plant and every downstream station sent cards upstream, physical paper cards, not my computer to tell it when to make more and what to make. All of a sudden, all of the piles of inventory just kind of disappeared. And as stuff moved through fast, you had to take care of problems when they occurred. You couldn't say, oh, that's a problem, put it in a pile. When you don't have piles for stuff to get old or lost or out of date or something like that, when everything has attention and flows fast, things tend to move through rapidly. So it's not about the speed. It's about not having the backlogs. It's about having a pull process. So what you, I don't like that word backlog. To me, backlogs are evil. I don't care where they are or whatever you want to call them. Backlogs are bad. They should, they've got horns on them. You should get rid of backlogs. And the way to get rid of backlogs is to create a pull process where downstream processes ask the upstream process to deliver more stuff. Then if stuff doesn't get pulled, get the, if stuff gets pulled, people can focus on the one thing that they're working on instead of five things. Instead of parking the three things you don't want to deal with and then working on the two, you need a process where everything smooth, flows smoothly not for the sake of speed, but for the sake of making sure that something from the time it starts till the time it gets done is constantly under um, being worked on, constantly has the attention of people. And so what you do when you're measuring the leanness of a process, you take something that starts at one end and pops out at the other, and you look what percentage of the time when that's moving through that flow stream, is it actually getting attention from people? What percentage of the time is it actually being worked on? And you'll find that percentage of the time can be really, really low, like a few percent or even less. And the higher you get that percentage, the, the more that thing flows through without stopping, the more you don't get problems built up and the more you are actually very likely to have constant attention on it the next downstream process, if they find something wrong, they can stop you know, the upstream one from making that mistake right away. You have increasingly higher quality as you have better mm -hmm. flow because the tension never leaves that item. And it's always being paid attention to problems are problems with it are resolved right away and they don't propagate to, to, you know, to neighboring items and stuff like that. So when Toyota did this very first pull system, what they discovered by surprise was that the quality of a rapidly flowing system was significantly higher than the quality of a system that had backlogs. And why? Well, we've never, it's, it's a sort of rule of thumb we've always seen when stuff flows through fast and people focus on it more or less constantly, it doesn't develop the problems that you see when stuff sits in piles and gets you know, pushed aside and not paid attention to. So things speed up, not because you're trying to be fast, but because you're trying not to have stopping points. No parking lots. The approach that you described, Austin, is basically value stream mapping. We've seen hundreds and hundreds of value stream maps and in almost all of them, the majority of the time, sometimes 90% of the time that any given thing um, is in that flow is wait time, hmm. waiting for the next step to be available. And the flow approach that Mary described is the way uh, lean thinking approaches um, speeding things up by not waiting. The other essential aspect that she described 
is single responsibility. People are prone to do whatever is least stressful. If you, again, if they have five things to do, they'll do the ones that are easiest, mm -hmm. the ones that are the most fun. Whereas if they only have one thing to do, they will get it done. They will focus on that one thing. And that single responsibility is multi-level. Um, the team should have a single responsibility to address a problem. Um, a product leader has a single responsibility to create a great product. Um, every step of the way should be focused on single responsibility of the people involved so that the quality has a chance mm. of achieving the purpose. That's great. I, I'm going to go to some of the questions that we've got on the, the chat now. Uh, we've got a few. So the first one, and I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. I apologize in advance. Shmuel Yerushalmi, who wants to ask if, um, if you think, if we think beyond the past 20 years, what is the impact you think the COVID-19 pandemic will have on approaches to quality in the next 20 years and beyond? Huh. The obvious thing is people are reconsidering their attitude toward remote work, um, toward equating hours with value as rewarded by salary, as rewarded by billing. Um, I think that the focus is going to shift, um, and this is almost a truism these days, from output to outcomes and impact that the work has. Um, when people are working remote, the uh, whole meaning of productivity changes. And the only meaningful metrics are no longer how many hours you work, do you stay, do you get there before the boss does and leave after the boss does? Or um, do you produce results that make a big difference to the people benefiting from the work? Mm. Um, the economics are going to force us in that direction. Um, I just read an article from Harvard Business School about the impact of the digital transformation on organizations. And um, it's absolutely profound. The old ways of thinking that were driven by old metrics are a recipe for bankruptcy today. Those organizations that work that way, that think that way will no longer survive in the next decade or 20 years. They'll be gone. And the, the organizations that are flexible, that are responsive, that are um, oriented to delivering valuable outcomes to the people they serve are the ones that will survive and the ones that will make money. The ones that focus on making money will not. Interesting. I, I agree. I also remember back in the 90s when I was totally astonished at what happened in the open source community. Because, you know, starting in the early 90s, there was this thing called, there was this guy in Finland who thought he could write an operating system. And, you know, 10 years later, Linux was the fundamental, most solid operating system, and it still is today. And nobody could figure out how all these people that didn't know, didn't never saw each other, in fact, didn't have video, they just used, you know, some sort of chat streaming stuff with search capabilities could write such solid software. And it's because two things, they did what they cared about. They were generally solving their own problems. That's what most open source contributors were doing was making it work for them. And second of all, there was a massive amount of responsibility to make sure that whatever you contributed would work, was good. Um, and if an error came up some, two or three years later, and it was in some code that you were involved in, you might be totally gone, but you would jump back in and try to figure out how to solve that problem because it was attached to something that you, you, you owned. The open source community has a huge amount to teach us about how you work remotely. Um, and because it was always about distance, 
which couldn't be bridged because people didn't intend to travel. It was always about how do you get together remotely and do really great stuff. And if, if when the pandemic came, I think we learned a lot about the good pieces of what happens with open source software. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't do really, really well getting together and having conferences where you can talk to people and stuff like that, but it's not the only way. Mm. And when it's, when it's remote, there is such a thing as ownership of responsibility for what you do. The other thing that makes has always made open source such high quality is it's always been um, reviewed. Code is reviewed uh, typically by a code committer. Uh, every code, every open source project has committers that are reviewing code and everybody is a volunteer. So a committer is not gonna review a big chunk of code, only a little tiny bit. And so code gets put into the system in small amounts, gets reviewed in small amounts, gets committed. And if there's an error, the whole community jumps on it and you know the poor person who committed it gets torn up and, and they learn how to code better. <laughs> and, and so there's, there's a lot to think about in how this concept of remote isn't new and worked really well in an age where we didn't even have half the technology we have now to make it work. What's valuable is not remote work and it's not work from anywhere. It's the um, increased respect for more dimensions of what it means to be a contributor to a joint enterprise. Um, it doesn't mean showing up. It doesn't mean hours. It means how much, what are you contributing that makes a difference? And I don't think that's going to contribute, going to continue forever being mm. primarily remote the way it is now. Um, because there are a lot of good things about being able to look somebody in the face, not just at a screen. There are good things about um, being able to read body language in person that um, mentoring, coaching, helping people grow is much easier person to person than it is um, remote. Um, the remote has taught us, hey, these are real people out there. They have pictures on their walls. They have dogs and kids and all sorts of things. Um, but, and that's absolutely good. But it's also taught us that um, there is more important things than showing up. Agree with both, all of those points. Um, I'm going to go to the next question from Tom Gilb. Sure. IBM, hey, Minis IBM Minnesota, who you might be acquainted with, used defect prevention processes to change root causes so defects were not inserted in the first place. Do you have any experience? Of Could you please questions? repeat that? I didn't quite get it. IBM Minnesota used defect prevention processes to change root causes so defects were not inserted in the first place. Do you have any experience of such processes? I don't. That's, I'm sorry. Well, that's exactly what you described in yeah. lean processes all over. Right. Um, we don't have any direct experience with um, the Rochester plant down there, um, but they've always been sensitive to what's effective in producing good quality work. And I'm not surprised that they have worked that way. I would expect that they probably started uh, 15, 20 years ago. I don't know. Um, last time I visited them was in the mid 90s. And that was again to teach some object oriented ideas and to learn about their um, framework that they were producing at the time. But Okay, thank you. We've got, we've got lots more that. questions. So I'll move on. Yes, to go ahead. Um, from uh, Jeff Moore, around the point of having customers involved early and not knowing fully what they wanted at the time of request, where is the line in the sand to try and deploy the request as an MVP and to make iterative changes later? Many experiences lead to a request lasting far past the estimated time frame to get the final product. So I guess where's that line in the sand for when you deploy or, or, or spend more time on it? Okay, well, there, there's two things, first of all, it's heavily context dependent because you know you can have software that's putting a rocket up in space and you can have software that's changing a website. Very, very different lines in the sand for one thing. But for another thing, 
What I'm looking for is that the delivery to customers these days, when we have deployment pipelines and customers that can see stuff soon, delivery to customers should create the feedback which causes the next step in development. So I'm looking for the development team to have access to the results of a deployment really rapidly, not always because not in all contexts, but in contexts where it makes sense to have the, the deployment cause a feedback and a change. And that would be very rapid. If that's possible, that's if you're in an online world, if you're doing software as a service, that's the way it ought to work. Um, when you're putting a control system in and you're not actually gonna put it in the plant for 18 months, which is kind of stuff I did, it's a little bit different, but that doesn't mean that you're not testing. I, I can remember I, I would write some code and I would have my physical hardware there and I would run it on the hardware and I would already have the hardware set up so that I would know if the test would pass the day I wrote it. So you're looking for very rapid feedback in some manner all of the time. And if possible, you're looking for the deployment to cause the next step. So in, in a lot of environments, you don't want any line in the sand. Hmm. You want to be able to constantly deploy and get feedback and pay attention to what something has done. Um, when you're doing big software hardware products, your line in the sand is probably like the next booster rocket launch, the next integrated test. We're going to test this in uh, six weeks. Like it or not, we're going to send a booster rocket up, have your best shot ready for them. And that would be the line in the sand. But to have lines in the sand after which you don't make changes, well, that's interesting, but that's kind of old fashioned. So we've got one question about system level aspects like performance and security. Um, because a system level, you know, individuals in the team might not have the visibility over some of those things. And is there anything you do differently with those? And I think maybe you just answered that a little bit when talking about SpaceX, you know, and integration testing. Yes. Uh, and having that line in the sand. Is that is that how you solve for those system level considerations? Um, it's one way, but um, you know, there's a whole bunch of ways to do performance testing now in what's called uh, re resilience engineering, or uh, uh, maybe it's a branch of reliability engineering, also called chaos engineering, where as you go along, and oftentimes in production environment, or maybe in a very well-defined pre-production environment, you actually cause problems or, or, or create huge amounts of volume or make something happen and see how the system reacts. And it's common to have resilience engineers on any very large system or any very in system where security is paramount. So where security really, really matters, the testing for it is not an after the fact thing. It's a constant ongoing basis. And the uh, people that understand security are part of the development team. And their job is to educate everybody on what works and what doesn't, or to find ways to point out to them when the code isn't going to make it. If you look at why Netflix started with chaos engineering, it's because they didn't have very good testing. Mm. And they knew that they didn't want the system to crash live. And so they started injecting faults so that the people who were writing the code would actually see their code fail and have to make it, make it work because otherwise that chaos monkey was going to come in and make it fail again. And they injected defects in there just in order to make people improve their code. <laughs> and, um, and it was in some sense, at least initially, in lieu of more aggressive other kinds of testing. The kinds of resilience and reliability testing that can be done now automatically are the kinds of things that test for these other features. Putting code right. in containers, running it in the cloud so that microservices are scalable. If you need more performance, you can add more servers executing the containers. Um, are powerful tools for avoiding those kinds of issues. Security, of course, is quite different. Great. So listen, well, that's all we're going to have time for. It's been fantastic to talk to you both. Uh, really, yes. really, really, really great chat. Lots of good points made. 
Um, we, uh, we always offer a free book from the BCS Bookshop to our speakers. Um, Mike, who kindly organized this session, Mike Harris, will be in touch afterwards about that. Great. Um, we've got a book uh, that a couple of the committee members have contributed coming out of BCS uh, about AI and software testing on the 1st of March. Wonderful. Um, you mentioned AI, that might be of interest to you. It will um, be very interesting. And there's plenty of other stuff on the bookshop as well. So um, thank you very to much. see how you test the data that trains the AI. Well, yeah, that's one of the one of the big aspects. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fascinating. <laughs> Great. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for thank attending. You. Our next event is on the 22nd of February about diversity and inclusion in testing and how it can make you a better tester. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.